Greetings, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana voice for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. We're delighted to welcome today Dr. Ilan Pape. I know that our audience, uh, uh, for our audience, Dr. Pape needs no introduction. I'll simply say that he's the University of Exeter's European Center for Palestine Studies and co-director of the Exeter Center for Ethnopolitical Studies and one of the Jewish members of the One Democratic State Campaign, a Palestinian-Israeli initiative to establish a constitutional democracy between the sea and the river, including the right of return. Ilan, welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Michael, and with anyone else who listens uh, to us. Politicians uh, in the US and in Israel who don't want to seriously deal with the Palestinian uh, Palestinians always fall back on the two state solution. And then they change the subject quickly. Uh, we know that the reality in Palestine and Israel is that it's already one state and it's a racist settler colonial state. You're involved in the One Democratic State campaign with our friend Jeff Halper. Uh, where do things stand with uh, the One Democratic State campaign now? Well, uh, the campaign is, is moving on uh, uh, successfully, I, I would say. More and more uh, uh, people are joining it. Uh, it is at the crucial moment now. Uh, we, we were always confident uh, that uh, Palestinian public opinion in particular and uh, small sections of the Israeli uh, uh, Jewish uh, public opinion and definitely uh, progressive people around the world support the idea. I mean, that was something uh, we knew we would, uh, can bu can build, would build on. Uh, the issue now is how to uh, dialogue with uh, politicians, leaders, and so on on the Palestinian side who still almost religiously adhere to the two-state solution uh, but really don't have any uh, counter plan uh, to, for instance, the, the deal of the century of the Trump Netanyahu uh, 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 administrations, or what one should call really the steel uh, of the century. Uh, and so there's no counter deal. And, and so our big challenge now is how to, to tap in into, into that kind of activity that has to be led and will be led, I'm sure by the Palestinians first and foremost, and hopefully we will be able to uh, recruit support and solidarity, not just from Jews around the world, which is relatively easy these days, but even from within uh, the Israeli Jewish society, because after all, they would be part of the solution, they're not just part of the problem. Uh, so that's where we are now. You raised a number of things just in what you had to say there. Uh, let me pick up on at least one of them. Um, Jeff always talks about the need for Palestinian leadership, and, and you referred to it as well. Yet when you talk to Palestinians, you, you get two different views, right? Uh, the first one is, yes, we're in. The only re realistic way forward, given the present realities on the ground, is one democratic state. On the other hand, no. Uh, Israel and their international supporters can't be trusted, and it's going to be like an Oslo too. So we'll end up with the short end of the stick. Can you understand Palestinians' reluctance to sign on to one democratic state campaign, and how do you overcome how do you overcome that hurdle? That's all I, I can fully sympathize with any uh, apprehensions about anything Israelis are involved with. I, I think uh, this is a particular one of the bitter lessons. Palestinians learned from Oslo when their representative body, the PLO, uh, uh, was going along with the so-called Israeli peace camp uh, that really betrayed them from the very beginning uh, and, and cheated and, and really uh, used the PLO recognition of Israel in order to uh, sterilize the Palestinian struggle uh, and to enable Israel to uh, continue the occupation by other means. So I'm not surprised that there is a lot of suspicion and I can understand it. 
I think the only way of, of dealing with it is to make sure that uh, people understand that when we talk about the one state campaign, we are talking about the change of paradigm, not just from two states to one state. That's one of them. But the second change or the second paradigm change that we are talking about is from an idea that peace is based on a dialogue between two peace camps on both sides, an Israeli peace camp and a Palestinian peace camp, which is not what we are doing, to the uh, paradigm that uh, could have been seen at, in the struggle of the ANC against apartheid South Africa, where actually the Palestinian national movement is leading the way with its own understanding of what uh, um, freedom and uh, uh, liberation, if you want, the liber what the liberation project uh, of Palestine means in the 21st century and re recruits uh, uh, Jewish members of the society uh, in Israel to, uh, to go along with them like the same way that white people joined uh, uh, the ANC. So it's not just a question even of uh, leadership that does not exist, and of course, unity that does not exist on the Palestinian side. Mm -hmm. I think it is uh, a different kind of uh, liberation uh, uh, project, uh, very much that in many ways continues the liberation project of Palestine that began in, in 1948, but one which is adapted to the realities of the 21st century, where the settler uh, community is already a third generation, where there are already six to seven million Jews to reckon with in, in historical Palestine. Uh, and all this has to be taken in, into account without undermining the basic idea of liberation, which is to liberate the Palestinians from more than a century of colonization oppression and dispossession. I have a number of questions here, but I wanna, I wanna keep following up on your first answer. You said that it would be easy to get Jews around the world to buy into this. You know, that's not been my experience here in the US. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about how, how you know, relatively yeah. speaking, uh, easy it would be to get Jews to sign on, especially in these days, you put it. Yeah, well, first of all, I compare it to the, uh, challenge we have in signing on Jews inside Israel. That, that's, <laughs> <laughs> compared to this, it's an easy, easy ride. Uh, but I do agree with you. I may have uh, exaggerated here, but my, my experience, especially with young Jews, with the young Jewish generation, including the young American uh, Jewish generation, uh, is that um, it's very difficult for conscientious, moral young people, a very, very much idealist, young people, which idealism is very strong at a younger age, uh, to, to identify uh, with what Israel stands for, not just with Israeli policies, but with a very basic idea of Israel, uh, especially in this time of ours where information flows easily. Uh, you cannot hide anymore uh, uh, what's going on. And, and um, I, I can give you one example, which I think sort of it will explain maybe what, where, from where I, do, I derive my, my, my optimism. Israel has a program called the Taglit uh, Discovery. Uh, in this program, Israel brings uh, young American Jews to, to, to Israel uh, with the hope that after the visit, they would uh, immigrate uh, to Israel, uh, give up their American Jewish identity and become Israelis. Now, uh, in, the, in the past, these uh, program included the uh, trips to the um, to the West Bank and uh, and a lot of the young uh, American Jews who, who participated in these journeys came back and became activists uh, for BDS uh, in, in American campuses. Now what Israel does now it takes I mean before COVID-19 nobody counts but before COVID-19 Israel used to take these young American Jews do a very quick tour around Tel Aviv and ship them back to the airport, not to show them anything that might, you know, contradict what they have been told about Israel. I think that it's it's very difficult to to maintain that kind of loyalty from Jews around the world when so much is exposed, so much is known about what is being what is being done, and and therefore, I'm more hopeful in making pathways into young, Ameri young Jews around the world 
And I know it would be much more difficult to recruit the significant uh, support inside the Jewish community in Israel for that idea. I want you to talk to me a little bit about the so-called, uh, uh, what a name, huh? the Abraham Accords, mm -hmm. uh, Israel's normalization with the UAE and Bahrain. Uh, Israel strengthens uh, its anti-Iran axis. Saudi's MBS is, is touted as a moderate. Trump and Netanyahu divert attention from their domestic troubles. And US arms dealers expand their reach into the Middle East. In fact, I, I think I read that you believe this will result in a new arms race. And this, all the while, the Palestinians are left further isolated. In fact, Israel just announced the expansion of thousands, new, thousands of new settlements in Beit El and Hargilo in the wake of the UAE announcement. Talk to us about the, the many levels, the many disturbing levels of this kind of deal. Yeah. So to be honest, uh, uh, some of it is not as new as it sounds, and sounds new because of the uh, hysteronics that uh, both the Netanyahu and uh, Trump administration uh, uh, gave it uh, because of their own domestic uh, problems. Uh, Israel uh, made the peace with uh, the Arab countries, which were, were and are much more important than the Emirates and Bahrain. Uh, and uh, this is Jordan and Egypt, and, and the peace with Jordan and Egypt was much more crucial and much more destructive and, 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 and negative in, in its impact on the Palestinians than uh, the so-called Abraham Accord. So we, we need to, to put things within a, a certain perspective. I think it would be a bit different if Saudi Arabia uh, would follow these two countries, but uh, these two countries did not have a war with Israel. Uh, Israel maintained the uh, economic relationship with these countries before. Uh, there's a lot of kind of drama uh, produced around it, uh, uh, which covers the lack of any true significance, I would say, for that. Um, and of course, it's, it's been manipulated in order to pressure the Palestinians, telling them, you see, this is the final proof that no one wants to support you in the Arab world, and therefore you are missing yet another opportunity uh, for peace, we're familiar with this uh, discourse. Now, uh, I, I don't think that this adds a particular uh, uh, pressure compared to everything that already has been happening. Uh, what I mean by this, that a silent support by MBS in Saudi Arabia to Israel is far more important than an official support uh, from, the, from the Emirates. So I think that's one level that we could take into account. The, se the second level is uh, that, um, Whatever Israel does successfully with uh, Arab countries so far away from it, uh, in the end of the day, it doesn't change the reality on the ground where 12 million people, more or less equally divided between Jews and Arabs, are, are, are living on the same space as settlers and natives, as occupiers and occupied, colonizers and colonized. Uh, nothing of the uh, Abraham Accord changes that a reality. The Palestinians are not going to go away. They're not going to give up their resistance. They may go through periods of more feeble resistance. They may go through periods of uprisings. Uh, we don't know. We, we cannot predict it. Uh, but this remains the main Israeli uh, issue of legitimacy and moral validity, not, not whether the Arab world accepts it or doesn't accept it. And that lack of moral validity uh, will continue to, to inform uh, what many good people in the world think about Israel, what many Muslims in the world think about Israel, and many Arabs think about Israel. And the last layer, I think it's very important to understand that in the Arab world, we, we have seen it during the Arab Spring, uh, regimes very rarely uh, uh, represent what their civil society wants. Uh, it's very mo most difficult in the Emirates to talk about society and regime. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a bit of an artificial state. But uh, in Bahrain, we know for sure that what the public opinion in Bahrain uh, thinks about uh, Palestine. We are familiar with the history of uh, the solidarity in Bahrain with the Palestinian struggle going back to the 1950s. Uh, uh, yes, you can impose your will on a society as an authoritarian regime, but that doesn't mean you represent 
that society. And uh, altogether, the, w w if and when the process of democratization from below, not from above, from below in the Arab world would be reignited, despite everything that happened after the Arab Spring, it will include also a demand from the rulers, governments, and regimes to take a far more proactive role in supporting the Palestinian and their stuff. What about this, uh, the level of the, the arms uh, that are being uh, sent to Bahrain from America and this, this arms race that you talk about? Again, uh, as the French say, it's very little new under the sun. Uh, <laughs> Uh, during the Cold War, uh, both the Soviet Union and the United States used the Middle East as the main laboratory for new weapons, uh, armed people to the peace in order to uh, give jobs to the, their own arms industries. Uh, I think that that part of the story should not be uh, uh, forgotten, uh, that it has a lot to do with arm industries in the United States and much less with the strategic interests of the United States. And yes, it's very dangerous because uh, uh, we saw uh, in the, uh, we know it now from America, Turkey, Israel, Hungary, so many other places, India, including, that a whimsical leader uh, who has uh, access to an army, that has access to weapons, lethal weapons, uh, uh, can be very pathetic, but at the same time can be very, very dangerous. Uh, uh, these weapons, in, in, in this, what I'm going to say now, I include Israel in this. These weapons are not going to be in the hands of very responsible people. These weapons are not going to be in the hands of people who are just using them to defend themselves. These weapons would be used as means to extend influence, regional influence, local influence, uh, and uh, what the Middle East needs is the armament, disarmament, rather than uh, extra armament, uh, which, to be honest, is the only thing the Americans can now provide is arms. Nothing else can come from Washington. No moral guidance, uh, uh, no wise ideas of how to solve conflict. The only thing the United States can sell now is death and weapons of destruction, uh, which is very sad for the United States. Uh, but is very, very dangerous for the people who live uh, in the region. You've suggested in some of your recent writings that uh, the Trump administration, quote, has created a new transparency that previous administrations engaged in double talk and were never serious, never had Palestinian interests in mind. And now Palestinians are free from that illusion. They don't need the United States for their own aspirations for statehood, they can just move on, as, as you put it. Say more about this. Yes. Well, first of all, I should say they should be free from this uh, <laughs> uh, notion. I don't know if, they, if uh, the government in Ramallah is able to do this. Uh, yes, I, I think for 50 years now, uh, Palestinian leaders, and not only they, uh, uh, visited uh, Washington endless times during the year whenever they were involved in the so-called peace process or diplomatic process, because the idea was that only a Pax Americana can be a basis uh, for a reconciliation process. And the reality on the ground was that America was a dishonest broker, and therefore any peace uh, a, a, a process that America was involved in uh, harmed the Palestinian interests and uh, distanced them even more from uh, freedom and, and liberation. Um, I think it's very difficult to convince people that there is an alternative to that, uh, but there is an alternative. Uh, 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 the West is not the rest of the world. I mean, there are countries, other countries in the world. Uh, there are very important Muslim countries like Malaysia uh, in Indonesia, there is South Africa, there are countries in South America, <coughs> sorry, uh, that could be uh, asked to take an international role in this. Uh, what I was trying to say is that even uh, uh, President Obama, who definitely uh, had a discourse which sounded more pleasant to the eyes of people like us who, who believe in peace and reconciliation, if you don't, if you look not only at his talk, but also, so to speak, at his walk, uh, 
didn't differ that much from previous American administration, uh, did very much what Trump did, but without announcing it, or maybe while uh, kind of uh, covering it. Uh, so there is this transparency, namely, uh, you are building settlements and we think that they are legal, and we don't say anymore that they are illegal, because it doesn't matter whether we say they're legal or illegal. We're going to build them and we're not going to do anything against that. You annex the Golan Heights and we don't do anything against it. You annex Greater Jerusalem and we don't do anything against it. So I'm afraid that even the Biden administration would uh, close its eyes if uh, Netanyahu would continue what his previous predecessors did, which is an incremental annexation of Area C without blowing the trumpets, without telling the world that's what we are doing. Now, since you are associated with ICAD and Jeff's uh, uh, activities on the, on the ground, you know that every, there isn't a day that passes in which Israel is not incrementally taking another piece of the West Bank de arabizes it and makes it part of the Jewish state. This has never stopped and this is going to continue. Uh, and there is this big difference between declarations and policies on the ground. And what Trump did, he narrowed the gap between declarations and the uh, actual real American policy. But I don't think he changed the American policy that dramatically. Uh, if I look at it as a historian, uh, on the period of American involvement that began somewhere in, in the late 1960s. You told Al Jazeera that um, American support for Israel comes more from non-Jews than Jews. And I'm gonna just quote you. In the Democratic Party, they are pro-Israeli because of the, the success of the Israeli lobby. In the Republican Party, it has a lot to do with Christian Zionism. So what's your take? Is there any hope coming out of the U.S. Uh, for human rights in Palestine. I mean, I'm involved, you know, with Jeff and uh, we're a, an activist organization here and there are more and more activist organizations, but on any kind of level, what's your take on what's coming out of the U.S. in terms of Palestinian support? Well, what we say about the Arab world, I think is true about the United States as well. We, we should distinguish between a, a regime in many ways and a civil society. Uh, and and I, I've never taken a determinist teleological view on American uh, position. I, I know, for instance, uh, quite well the period of the Kennedy administration. Uh, a very interesting, uh, uh, even before that, the Eisenhower administration. Uh, although the policies of both these presidents towards uh, progressive uh, Arab regimes was nothing to write home about, uh, they took quite a, a moral position on the Palestinian refugee question. Uh, in fact, APAC was founded because there was a sense, especially during the, uh, the, the years of the Eisenhower administration, but it continued into the Kennedy administration, uh, that Israel is unable to change a basic American position on the inevitability of the right of return of the refugees. I don't know how many people know it. Uh, and in 1960, in fact, we know that David Ben-Gurion, as Prime Minister of Israel, uh, was uh, pressured Israeli academia to, to manipulate facts and produce a scholarly narrative that Israel had nothing to do with the refugees in an attempt to, to convince uh, the Kennedy administration not to go to the United Nations and ask for a more assertive demand from Israel to return uh, the refugees. So history teach, I don't want to go too, too deeply into that historical incident, as interesting as it is. Uh, but it, what it means is that um, things can change, uh, first of all, at the, the, the regime level, for, for various reasons. Not all of them always altruistic and, and positive, but, but they can change. You know, uh, an economic crisis in America can also undermine American support uh, for Israel. Uh, secondly, the younger generation of all religions and persuasions in the United States, I noticed, uh, I may be wrong, uh, uh, especially those who eventually meet uh, in the universities, in the campuses uh, 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 around America, uh, seem to, to, to understand, uh, if they have a modicum of decency in them, uh, that uh, supporting Israel is an immoral thing to do. And uh, some of them don't do much with that uh, revelation. Quite a few of them do a lot with that. 
And this is one of the reasons that Israeli diplomats don't like to go to American universities uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, oh, yes, they're fighting back. They're trying to censor uh, uh, the campuses again on the question of Palestine. I'm not saying that the battle is over, but it shows you that there's something to battle against. And what they're battling against is that the younger uh, generation of the United States, uh, those who are uh, really, uh, uh, those who care about African-American rights, those who care about Native American rights, those who care about women's rights, people who are conscientious uh, 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 members of society and who are troubled by injustice in the United States are people that Israel will not be able to recruit anymore. Uh, and, and, and I think, therefore, there are undercurrents in American society which make me hopeful. I, I fully understand that they have not reached uh, uh, the Congress or the level of the government or even mainstream media. But you can see some, you know, uh, kind of harbingers, one could call them, of a different era to come, whether these are the three brave women who sit in the House of Representatives, uh, articles like those by Peter Baynard, uh, in the New York Times, not everything is my position, but it just, even Bernie Sanders uh, as a candidate, as a powerful candidate, these are all, uh, I think, indications that there is there a potential for a different American uh, position. I don't know exactly when it will unfold, but uh, I would not give up on, on, uh, on a different American uh, position in the future. Ilan, for many of us, your seminal ethnic cleansing of Palestine uncovered so much rich historical material for our activism. Uh, it's required reading for anyone taking up the cause for Palestinian rights, I think. One page after the other details how the ethnic cleansing project of Israel was from the start a coordinated long range policy ordered at the highest levels of government. Tell us what led to your research and were you surprised by anything that you learned? Yes, uh, well, it started by uh, a choice of becoming a professional historian and do a, a doctorate in history. Uh, I, was, I, I understood that if I want to work in a more free environment, I should leave Israel uh, for the PhD and, and I went to Oxford. I also took a kind of a conscious decision to be supervised uh, by an Arab supervisor if I want really to, to see things from different from the way I, I was seeing them before I came to England. Uh, so it started with kind of a typical PhD based on archival material that began to be released on, on 48. Uh, but when I started the PhD and I published it and uh, I came back to Israel and then I learned that there were other historians like Benny Morris working on, on that period. And we all found a lot of things that we didn't know about and were contradictory to what uh, we were told. Even at that stage, I think we, we all, all of us assume that this is what happens in a war. Uh, people are being kicked out. Uh, people are getting massacred. But I think at, at the first stage of, of my career as an academic, I didn't see the connection between that in any substantial fundamental issues with the state in which I was living uh, and its ideology. Uh, what really changed uh, uh, um, my mind and, and uh, really sent me back to research on 48 in 2000, and it took me seven years to publish the book Ethnic Cleansing in 2007, was the, 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 the second uprising. And it's, uh, the second uprising in 2000 spilled into Israel. Uh, and the level of racism, the willingness of the Israeli police to kill, to kill uh, unarmed Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, uh, for me was a wake-up call. And, 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 and I, I began to see uh, the picture in a different way. I understood that it was not a history of exception, exceptional brutality here and there, but th there was an inherent brutality, there was inherent racism in the project. Uh, and uh, I was also lucky that uh, in the late 1990s, Israel released some, a lot of documents it did not release in the 70s, uh, uh, mainly military documents. And that really complemented 
uh, 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 the picture. Uh, and I think more importantly for me was not just uncovering what many Palestinians knew anyway, what happened in 48, but what was the result of a world that was indifferent to what Israel did. Uh, in fact, was silent about what Israel did. Uh, uh, what was the price Palestinians paid after 1948 for that global, especially Western, moral position? And that meant that since the ethnic cleansing was incomplete in 1948, Israel could continue with it in different means and different modes uh, until today. So I think that was part of, of, of the kind of background for the project. The ongoing Nakba. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, one of the things uh, that your research really uh, solidified for me and what I, I learned quite a bit about that I think is underplayed is the, uh, uh, the many layers of Plan Dalit. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk, uh, I usually refer to Plan Dalit because it is so important to understand the long range planning that this is about. Say more about Plan Dalit, would you please? Yeah. yeah. Um, Plan, Plan, uh, there were Plan D, Dalit is D, as everybody knows. So it's the fourth plan. Uh, uh, the, the leadership, the Zionist leadership in, in mandatory Palestine had three previous plans uh, in which it tried to articulate the strategy for uh, the future uh, uh, for the event of the end of the mandate. And, and plan, plans A and B were quite vague uh, and were also not very clear and they were produced in 45, 46, <clears throat> because it wasn't very clear whether the British are going to be and, and there was yet no proper military infrastructure to the, for the Jewish community. Uh, things have changed uh, in 1947 um, and um, uh, the knowledge that there would be a certain end to the mandate uh, really pushed things uh, forward. And it evolved a lot around the personality of the leader of the community, the Jewish community in Palestine, David uh, Ben-Gurion, uh, who uh, understood that he needs a systematic strategy uh, in order to deal with two uh, uh, challenges. Now that the challenge of getting rid of the British was over, there were main, two main challenges. Uh, one is uh, how to turn a, a, a demographic a Palestine where demography uh, is contrary to the Zionist vision, maybe the Jews are a minority. Uh, and secondly, what should the, the community do if the Arab world would be recruited to help the Palestinians against a Zionist assault, so to speak. Uh, and, and Plan D really takes uh, this challenge into account. It first explains that before an Arab a possible Arab counter uh, action, uh, Israel has to uh, complete as much as it can of its ethnic cleansing operation. Namely, while the British are still uh, in Palestine uh, and before one Arab soldier can enter from the neighboring Arab countries. And, and, the, and, and that is one essence of Plan D that comes not only in the doc document that was known as Plan D, which was a kind of... Uh, a publicized uh, uh, few pages of, of strategy that was distributed to politicians and the Jewish community, but a far more elaborate uh, structure of operational orders to uh, uh, brigades and, 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 and uh, battalions uh, on the ground. Um, and, and the idea was really to, to cleanse as much of Palestine before a possible confrontation with regular uh, Arab armies. And therefore the plan uh, uh, in particular focused on those concentration of Palestinian demography where there was a, a large number of Palestinians, namely the urban centers, the towns, the cities. Uh, and and uh, the immediate uh, result of the plan, or that part of the plan, was uh, in April the, the, the destruction of the urban centers of Palestine, A, because there were a lot of Palestinians there, and B, because the elite was there. And the idea was that if you get rid of the elite before May the 15th, ex ethnically cleansing the rest of Palestine would be, would be easier. And so the second challenge 
uh, the plan uh, definitely uh, understood, probably based on their own intelligence uh, reports, uh, uh, that the Arab world was not militarily ready for a proper operation, uh, was not coordinated, and most of the fighting, which indeed is what happened, would be on the border of historical Palestine, rather inside Palestine itself, which meant that Israel could continue with the ethnic cleansing also after uh, Arab armies entered Israel on the 15th of May, 1948. The plan is very detailed. Uh, the operational orders are particularly detailed. Uh, uh, you, military units gets, get a list of names of villages, uh, uh, and it says in a clear Hebrew, uh, you should uh, decide whether you want to destroy the village, to expel, to, le to leave it under military rule, it's up to, to, the, um, uh, to the commander. Uh, and what is important is, of course, and that's the work of the historian. You take the orders and you take the consequences. And when you look at the consequences, you understand that almost at every given moment where a local commander took a decision whether to destroy or to leave people, uh, destruction and expulsion was the default. Uh, and I, we interviewed, uh, a friend of mine and myself, we interviewed quite a lot of these commanders. And they said the main reason we did it, because we understood that this is what the political leadership wants us to do. Even if they didn't, even if they left us the, the, the right to decide, uh, we knew what they expected of us. By the way, which is exactly what uh, in Serbia and Croatia and Bosnia, people involved in destruction of villages said, uh, to the International Court of Justice when they asked why did you destroy a village when there was no direct order to do this. They said because we knew that this is what the political leadership leadership expected us to do, which is very typical to ethnic cleansing uh, operations. In your book, uh, Ten Myths About Israel, you begin uh, this way. History lies at the core of every conflict. A true and unbiased understanding of the past offers the possibility of peace. The distortion or manipulation of history will only sow disaster. Then you go on to say, Zionism is not, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Zionist historical account is based on a cluster of myths. So I want you to talk about two of the myths uh, mm -hmm. uh, that you listed. First of all, Zionism is not colonialism. Mm -hmm. And the second one, Zionism is the only democracy in the Middle East. Yeah. The first myth is always something that bewildered me because as a historian, I read a lot of the early Zionist uh, documents, speeches, uh, letters, uh, public appearances. And, and uh, there is not one Zionist leader that does not try to convince uh, leaders in the West to support Zionism with, that is not using, who is not using the term colonialism in order to make sure that people would support them. And the Z early Zionist institution include the colonialist, the colonial bank, colonies, colonization, whether they spoke in Yiddish, German, Hebrew, or English, or French, the word that they were using to describe what they're going to do in Palestine was colonization and building colonies. So um, I understand that the PR of colonialism has changed over the years, uh, but there's no way of uh, 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 taking it out of history. Uh, Zionism was a colonialist project first and foremost in the eyes of the Zionist leaders. Secondly, uh, uh, due to great developments in uh, the research uh, academic research in recent years, and even longer than recent years, uh, we came across a more fine tuning of the term uh, colonialism, which is settler colonialism, uh, which uh, enabled us to understand how can a colonialist project exist if it doesn't have a mother country, a metropolis, which was the main counter argument against people who said, well, how can you say Zionism was colonialism? There was no Britain or France. Uh, there was its mother country that sent the colonialists. And indeed, settler colonialism, as we know from the United States, among other places, is uh, a, a phenomenon of Europeans who are being chased out of Europe or flee out of Europe 
because they are persecuted or because they fear for their life or whatever reason and, and do not believe that they can stay in Europe and try to recreate the Europe on someone else's homeland. Uh, and, and that is what they're using on the same means of colonialism. In fact, quite a lot of scholars of settler colonialism claim that settler colonialism is even more brutal than colonialism because colonialism wants to exploit the native. Whereas settler colonialism, as we know from the United States, wants to get rid of the native population. Uh, in, in North America, this was translated into genocide. In Palestine, it was translated and still is translated uh, into ethnic cleansing. And the second one, uh, Zionism is the only yeah, democracy. The second miss, at least. Yeah. 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 The second miss is a, another kind of uh, uh, exercise I, I, I did for myself, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I took the most uh, benign and conventional uh, definition of democratic states, even those which were not very uh, complementary to, to democracy, but sort of gave us an idea of what a democracy looks like, even not an ideal type democracy, it's a normal democracy. And uh, none of these fit the reality in which for more than 50 years, uh, there are millions of people without basic human rights and civil rights just because they are Palestinians who live in the West Bank or are sieged in a ghetto in the Gaza Strip, uh, that uh, they are, even if they have the right to vote and be elected inside Israel, are barred from living in uh, towns and certain uh, settlements, are uh, discriminated against, not because of what they do, but because of who they are. Uh, it's very difficult to, to see any country in the world that uh, is regarded in political science as democracy falling into this uh, category. So um, I, I think that uh, uh, Israel uh, is, is not a democracy in that sense. It is a bit of a democratic uh, master race, democracy, as, uh, as people used to call uh, apartheid South Africa, where there were certain democratic um, uh, mechanisms for the white community to elect their leaders and so on, but the rest of the non-white community did not enjoy the fruits of that uh, uh, democracy. Um, uh, and this, if you combine the two myths together, by the way, that Israel is a settler colonial state and it's not a democracy, you can understand why they are, it's easy for Israel, relatively easy for Israel, to sell part of the puzzle without showing the rest of the puzzle and saying this is democratic, go and visit Tel Aviv, a groovy democratic city, see, uh, meet uh, Palestinian members of Knesset. How can you say that we are not a, a democracy? I mean, there are definitely sections and, and features of the society which are democratic in nature, but they don't undermine the non-democratic apartheid uh, uh, identity and nature of the state as a whole. You know, uh, um, this idea of these myths, uh, there, there's so many levels uh, to this, Ilan. Um, everything from disinformation campaigns to uh, American talking points to the Ministry of Hasbara uh, to the erasing, erasing of Palestinian culture, villages, and more. Talk to us a little bit about disinformation about uh, Hasbara um, uh, and the erasure of Palestinian culture. Yes, uh, uh, part of any settler colonial project is to uh, appropriate the history of the native, so to speak, and expunge the indigenous population from the history of, of the country. Uh, uh, it begins with um, uh, building uh, Jewish settlements over destroyed uh, Palestinian villages in 1948 and giving them the names of the Palestinian village, but in a Hebrew version. Uh, so uh, Safuria becomes Tipori, Lubia becomes uh, Lavi. The reason is to say that actually originally this was a, a biblical village uh, that was usurped by force by the Palestinians. Of course, there's no historical, uh, this is so, so bizarre as a, as, a, as a historical statement that it doesn't deserve really going into it. But it's one, one, one side of the fabrication. It continues with a very uh, uh, intensive work in the Israeli foreign ministry 
to prepare a narrative of the Palestinians leaving uh, voluntarily uh, their homes in which they lived for hundreds of years, uh, as if the Palestinians are marathon right, uh, uh, you know, runners who like just one day to take everything they have and, and run away. But uh, Israeli academia was recruited to, to, to sell this uh, lie about uh, uh, a society which was not really attached to the land, and that's why it was very easy to convince them to leave. So Israel has no responsibility uh, for it, denying, of course, the, the, the systematic expulsion we were talking about. Uh, then there is the whole uh, issue of security uh, uh, and rights. Uh, uh, if you uh, kind of try to educate the world that an indigenous native people, like the Palestinians, are terrorists in potential, um, and, and therefore everything you do to them is justified, either because they committed the terrorist act or they will commit the terrorist act. And the world does not expose this uh, cynical, insidious uh, idea. Uh, you, you can see how this publication uh, is working uh, to the level of a, a TV series like Fauda uh, that Netflix is, is, is producing in the United States. Uh, it is, it is a, an amazing kind of success which I hope is now uh, losing its uh, validity, to um, portray the Palestinians as immigrants, first of all, who should behave well in their host country, where actually the host country immigrated into the, into the people. And, to, and secondly, because they are immigrants who uh, are involved in the liberation struggle, they are irresponsible immigrants, ungrateful immigrants. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, Israeli experts are invited all over Europe to participate in meetings of how to deal with the Muslim immigration uh, into Europe, as if Israel is also a country facing Muslim immigration. Uh, these, we, we need to expose these impossible associations and links that are being done and are part of this web of lies and fabrications I was talking about. You're a supporter of uh, BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. Talk to us about the various levels at which BDS is working. What are some of its most recent successes and what more needs to be done? Yeah, I, I think, first of all, the BDS is really a, a tough dialogue with the Israeli society, but a very necessary one because every other means to stop the uh, uh, brutal oppression of the Palestinians has, has failed so far. And I think. Uh, this uh, it, it's it's a young process, so to speak. So it's too premature to assess whether it will be uh, as effective as, as we hope it will be. Uh, it has some successes, already some notable successes, uh, and I will point to to some of them. One, it galvanized uh, 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 solidarity with the Palestinians at a time where it was difficult for solidarity movements to understand who represents the Palestinians. How does a solidarity group uh, react to disunity in the camp in which uh, uh, it's supposed to help? Uh, and it gave a very consensual way of working above the issues of one state or two states or Hamas or Fatah. And I think that was one very important achievement. Secondly, it created the direct link with the, between the civil society in occupied Palestine and inside Israel and the solidarity movement. Uh, Sometimes this links before were through mediators. Now I think there's much more direct, intimate link. It, and, and solidarity is based on you hear what people want you to do, you don't tell them what to do. And I think this effect of the BDS emerges as an initiative of the uh, civil society uh, is very helpful to make the solidarity movement more authentic and more useful, I think. And then there are the successes in the universities. I think we're beginning to see not just a lot of activism uh, on, on the campuses, uh, which recruits a lot of young people who were not there before on the Palestine issue, but even influencing curricula of uh, courses and modules, uh, uh, teaching uh, plans, uh, you know, unthinkable things are happening, like teaching Palestine in a module or course on colonialism or an ethnic lensing, or even on genocide studies. Uh, this was unheard of uh, before, and I think these will have long-term effects of, 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 on the population. 
And then there are the, some of the economic successes, uh, convincing uh, trade union churches uh, to divest uh, and uh, to uh, limit action of some of the multinational corporation uh, uh, from uh, being involved uh, in, the, in the occupation and assisting it. And finally, contrary to what some of our friends warned us, in fact, the BDS increased the number of Israeli academics supporting it rather than objecting it. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can prove it very easily. When we started as a group of Israeli academics who uh, responded to the call on BDS from the Palestinian society, we were six or seven people. Uh, the numbers are much higher now. And for the first time, we hear Israeli uh, academics who are presidents of universities or uh, provosts uh, expressing at least some concern on uh, the lack of academic freedom in the occupied territory, uh, something they've never done before. So I think that these are influences that uh, only time will tell when they will fuse together into a powerful uh, uh, wave, uh, how, how, how important they were uh, if we get to that point where really the reality on the ground will change uh, fundamentally. Talk to us about the Palestinian right of return. You, you, uh, you call it part of a blueprint for restorative justice for the Palestinian people. Yes, I think for me, it's, uh, for me, it's very clear that this is a precondition uh, for any uh, uh, genuine reconciliation in Palestine. First of all, the principle recognition in the right of return. Before I'm talking about, to talking about how practically it can be implemented, uh, I, I think that only through uh, uh, an international recognition and in the end of the day, an Israeli recognition, or the Palestinian right of return, we can understand that the moral basis for a future solution has been laid. As I say, there are many practical issues with it, but to begin with, it has to be the basis for any uh, idea of reconciliation, because that means that uh, the ongoing Nakba, as we called it, the ongoing ethnic cleansing has come to an end, that there is a closure. Uh, and uh, that you are rectifying the uh, past, the, the evils of the past, which do not only include return, by the way, they would include the redistribution of natural resources, such as land, uh, uh, giving up on privileges that the Jewish society has uh, today and granting equal rights to everyone who lives there and everybody who comes back. So it's part, for me, it's part of the of a larger idea of restorative justice and, and reconciliation. But I think that, you know, uh, if for 50 years experts around the world uh, were involved in, in uh, finding out what is the best uh, solution through the paradigm of a two-state solution that totally ignored the right of return, we could have used those 50 years to work out, uh, I'm sure we would have uh, succeeded, in working out how practical, in, in practical means, how to implement the right uh, of return. Uh, and, and by the way, um, uh, this is not exceptional. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, refugee problems are solved by resettlement, but there are quite a few uh, examples of repatriation. Uh, and there are United Nations mechanisms for repatriation that take care of the rights, not just of the refugees, but the people who live in their homes, the people who live on their fields. Uh, we don't have, contrary to what people think, uh, we don't have to invent the wheel. We just have to accept that there are universal principles that allow millions of people to come back to a homeland from which they were, from which they were forcefully removed. They and their families, should they want to do this? We don't know how many would want to do this, how many would want to come back permanently, but this is not the issue now. The issue now is to say this is a sacred individual right of every Palestinian right, uh, uh, which is beyond the question of the political uh, regime that would replace the present one. This is uh, above it. It's kind of a meta issue uh, without which you cannot believe, the Palestinians will not believe that they have a genuine partner for reconciliation on the other side. I just have a couple more questions for you. Um... 
we you brought up the United Nations. You know, we're we who are activists in the struggle for Palestinian rights often look to the UN, the World Court, international law, other international institutions to, that will buttress. You know, that will add to the momentum for a solution mm -hmm. in Palestine and Israel. Yet, you know, after a while, you begin to wonder if they have any teeth. In, um, what's the role of these international institutions in your view? Well, uh, there are two, two, two uh, uh, aspects to, 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 to your question. One is to, to remember that while uh, the peace process that was led by the United States and its allies had a very clear uh, uh, preference for Israel's uh, interests, basic ideas and concepts of a solution, the United Nations left uh, a, a modicum of space for a Palestinian uh, position through the, its committee for the inalienable rights of the Palestinian uh, people. Uh, a, a body that meets every year, doesn't have any sanction, of course, or power of sanctions against Israel, but it keeps, keeps the issue of Palestine alive as a moral issue. Uh, and not just uh, an idea uh, that is at the heart of Pax Americana, that a solution means to satisfy Israel in a way that may give some sort of uh, uh, benefits, very limited benefits to some of the Palestinians. Uh, so I, I think the United Nations is still a venue where uh, at least in terms of discourse, in terms of an ethos, in terms of narratives, it's still a space where you can hear more freely the truth about what happened and, and goes on. So that's important by itself. It's, it doesn't mean that they have some. Secondly, I, I connect, and that's the second aspect. Um, there is a certain global balance of power when it comes to Palestine, where certain members of the Security Council are the ones who determine what should be the United Nations position. I'm not sure that's the only way that the United Nations can be operative in Palestine. Uh, and I go back to what I said before in countries such as Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, uh, countries in South America, uh, South Africa, uh, a, a non-Western alliance, if you want, uh, that uh, can really also use the United Nations in different ways to make it far more effective uh, in, in determining uh, what is the international uh, public opinion or what is the global public opinion on Palestine and give it some, some strengths. Uh, 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 we see, it's the same battle you see around the International Court of Justice. Yes, the United States does all it can to uh, limit this uh, 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 ICG, ICJ uh, to, to places where America doesn't, meet, doesn't uh, uh, regard as important, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that this is an, you cannot penetrate the walls of this American uh, wall of immunity or the walls of immunity that America has erected around the ICJ and other bodies of the United Nations. So I, I think we shouldn't give up on the United Nations, but I think it has to be part of a more uh, a, a comprehensive campaign to look at a different global dimension to the conflict, which is not planted deeply in the West. You write in The Forgotten Palestinians about Palestinians living within Israel. The perception of the Palestinians as unwanted and unwelcome has remained a potent part of Zionist discourse and attitude in what became Israel in 1948. Then you go on to say, they're a heterogeneous community, Christians, Muslims, Islamists, secularists, and more, living side by side with each other as a minority community. And further, you're right, theirs is an amazing story of almost impossible navigation in a sea of colonialism, chauvinist nationalism, fanatic religiosity, and international indifference. So talk to us more about these forgotten Palestinians. Yeah. Yes, I, it, this particular uh, paragraph was written with genuine emotion. Uh, because I have, uh, since I'm, uh, and, I, and I spend a lot of my time in Israel, as well as in the UK, and I have very few Jewish friends, I have to say the truth. 
not surprisingly, maybe. Uh, and I have many, 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 many Palestinian friends, and I feel very much part of the uh, community, not not as a Palestinian uh, uh, Israeli, but uh, as Palestinian Jews. And um, uh, and I'm surprised at the humanity that exists there, uh, and the uh, and the impulse that is still there to to live. To, to find a peaceful reconciliation uh, with the Jews and understanding that there could be a good future for both people if only the Zionist, if only Zionism would uh, be removed as the ideology of the of the regime, and, and and it's all done in in most cases on the basis of of humanity, universal values, and so on. And I'm very impressed when this is still a basic attitude under such harsh uh, conditions that I mentioned. This community, we have to remember, this community was under a harsh military rule until 1966, uh, which uh, those of you who are familiar with the uh, evils of military rule in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip would know what it looks like, but it looked like this for the Palestinians and Israel. Things got better after 67, but um, on a daily basis and an individual basis, uh, some of the experiences remind us of the still experiences of African Americans uh, today in the United States, which came to the fore in the encounters with the police. Uh, uh, but some of it is very unique uh, to a whole community that uh, maybe the best example to explain <laughs> to explain it. Imagine if. Uh, the affairs and future and status of the Jewish community in the United States would be handled only by the FBI. Imagine such a situation where people would say, you know, when it comes to American Jews, uh, it's not the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Industry, you know, wh whoever, you may see, no, this is, you know, a potential fifth column. This is a potential enemy. So a decision who can be a teacher, who can work where they, they want to work, who can settle where they want to settle, uh, who can move freely and who cannot move freely, and mass as a group, not as individuals, is determined by the experts of internal security. Um, living under such a, a, a precarious a condition uh, is by itself a huge hardship. Uh, to this, one could add the fact that for a while the Palestinian National Movement uh, forgot about them as well, and the two-state solution also marginalized them as, as, as an issue. That's why the one uh, state, the one democratic state campaign is so important, I think, for that particular community, because it wants to uh, uh, rearrange or reframe the relationship between Jews and Palestinians all over historical Palestine, not just in small part of it. So this is a very important community, uh, a very uh, uh, impressive uh, community uh, that in many ways know intimate, knows intimately both communities and uh, 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 can, un can, can easily foresee a different life with a Jewish community based on equality, maybe more than people in the West Bank who only know Israelis as settlers and soldiers, and soldiers, uh, and I think that <clears throat> their history should be taught, and uh, their role should be far more significant in the liberation project of Palestine than it was until now. <clears throat> One last question: um, You've been a relentless seeker of truth, of a true and honest rendering of history, even at uh, great personal cost. What keeps you going? What inspires you and gives you hope that your work uh, might play a role in building peace with justice? Well, I think there are several things that uh, allow someone like me, and I'm not, as you know, I'm not the only one. There's quite, quite a few of us, uh, not just in the case of Palestine, but around the world, thank God. Uh, I think that uh, there are a few things that work here. One, there is a moment, and I never, I wasn't able to define it for myself, but I know there was a moment where you sort of cross the Rubicon, you cross the river, and you know there's no way back. And actually you feel very liberated uh, when you, you understand that 
uh, uh, this is now what you're going to do, and you feel at peace with yourself for doing it. And that really is the best immunity shield from any hardships uh, uh, that you meet uh, on the way. And, and uh, I think that a lot of people uh, uh, who uh, face injustice and decide to act against injustice have such a moment. Uh, when they understand the price that they might pay for this, but the struggle uh, becomes more important than the price. Secondly, I know that the price paid by my Palestinian friends uh, is much higher, uh, far, far much higher than I ever paid or would pay. Uh, and that gives me a lot of strength to see their steadfastness, their courage, uh, and their commitment. And I'm very much inspired by them. And, and, and their action and a and, 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 and way of, of uh, uh, acting towards the, the predicaments that faces them. Uh, and finally, I think that um, I feel that actually for the sake of even the Israeli Jews, it's good that people like myself exist because I think in the end of the day, it would make sure that the solution would be based on restitution and not retribution, that uh, it gives hopes, hope to the Palestinian and Arab side that there are people who they can rely on, who they could live with uh, and coexist and build together a different society. I think it's very important to have indicators uh, for the oppressed people, the colonized, the persecuted, uh, that there are uh, uh, people with a different uh, take uh, that originally are part of the privileged uh, oppressed, oppressor, the society of the oppressor. Uh, looking at history, I know that this kind of presence was very important in the more successful uh, reconciliation process that followed years of colonization or dictatorship or uh, long periods of abuses of human and civil rights. Ilan Pape, thank you for joining us today. We're grateful uh, that you were able to spend some time with us. Uh, for the rest of you, you'll be able to find all our interviews on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel. Check them out. And thank you all for joining us today. <laughs>